Today we have quite an exciting one for you. It is the introduction to industrial data communication and it is a technical topic webinar presented to you by Dr. Hardy Harb, who is an EIT lecturer and consultant. Some common uh, questions, FAQs. Uh, so everyone who registered for this particular webinar will receive a copy of the PDF slides as well as the video recording within two business days uh, from the day that the webinar uh, runs. Uh, if you could please just check under the junk spam and promotional folders of your mailbox. Uh, these details will be sent for you there and you can easily access a recording of this webinar and go over some key important points that Dr. Hardy will be showing us today or sharing with us rather. As this a is a technical topic webinar, you will be receiving a uh, certificate of attendance. It will be a digital certificate of attendance for uh, attendees who attended this webinar live. Uh, and what you need to do to receive this uh, particular certificate uh, is that you'll have to either scan the QR code or follow the link in order to fill in the Microsoft form. And then once that is completed, you will get your certificate within about four business days, but you will need to complete uh, the Microsoft form in order to get uh, your certificate of attendance for this particular topic. Okay, a little bit more about EIT if this is your first time joining us. So what EIT is, is that we are an engineering specialist. We offer engineering courses that are accredited by the engineering, uh, that are accredited by the Australian government rather. Uh, so we offer industry orientated programs uh, that range uh, from a professional certificate all the way to a doctor of engineering. Depending on whether you have work experience in the field, you have prior qualifications, in engineering or you're just someone who'd like to upskill and gain some professional development. So we offer world-class Australian accredited qualification and depending on the qualification that you're interested in, uh, in rather, you might even enjoy the benefits of international recognition under the Dublin Accord, Sydney Accord, as well as the Washington Accord, depending on the course that you are uh, interested in studying uh, at EIT. Now we have industry experienced lecturers. Dr. Hardy is one of them. Uh, these people have worked in the field and now are transferring the knowledge and skills that they've gained uh, in the real world into the classrooms that we offer, whether it being virtual or in person in our campuses in Australia or live as we are doing uh, right now. We offer a unique delivery models. Uh, we have online classes and online courses. All our courses can be started absolutely 100% online. And then our HE courses, that being the Bachelors of Science, uh, the Masters, as well as the Doctor of Engineering can be offered on our campuses in Australia, Melbourne, and in Perth. And quite excitingly, we are actually open up an open, opening up another campus in uh, Brisbane shortly. Uh, we don't have a turnaround time. However, we will keep you guys posted in case you are interested in studying abroad broad. Okay. Without wasting any more of your time, I'd like to present Dr. Hardy. Dr. Hardy, the stage is yours. Thank you so much for joining us. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Zepiso. So uh, let me open for the moment the camera. Hello, everyone. So my name is Hadi Harb. I will be uh, going through this um, webinar with you. I, uh, I am a lecturer at EIT, also a consultant, mainly in artificial intelligence and um, signal processing. And uh, so I started like in the early 2000s uh, in this uh, area and had experiences uh, ranging from engineering to research scientists to consultants and to lecturing. So we'll get into uh, today's topics. Let me close the camera now. OK, so today it's an introduction. This course is an introduction. Uh, sorry, this webinar is an introduction to data communication in the context of um, industrial uh, settings. So industrial data communication. Uh, we will start with an introduction, then the basics of data communication. And then we'll concentrate more on what makes 
industrial data communication specific because it's not the same as data communication that you would expect in more of a consumer setting, then we'll be reviewing some standards and technology that are common in industrial data communication, uh, current trends. We'll try to, to do a demo to show you the effect of um, delays, for example, in data communication, how strict it can be in an industrial setting. And finally, uh, questions and answers. So communication is clearly what we humans do all the time. We communicate, and this is what led to uh, the development of humans and human societies. But the same clearly is needed by computers. We are talking here about data communication, meaning communication between devices. Now, communication between devices in an industrial setting, it could mean like one device would be a sensor. Another device could be a controller. So the sensor gets the measurement. So we are measuring, for example, temperature in a certain room. And we want to send this information to a controller so that the controller can make a decision on whether uh, the heating should be increased or decreased, for example. So we need this kind of exchange of information. The sensor will measure, and then the data should be transmitted to the controller. Eventually, the controller will be transmitting some data to another device. Let's say we would call it an actuator. This actuator, what it does actually is, it's going to act. Like my actuator here could be a valve or a pump that's pumping fuel in a heater. So the more we, we pump fuel, the more heat we'll be generating. So we need this kind of exchange of information. In a traditional setting, so without digital data communication, this exchange of information would be analog. Analog in the sense that the sensor would measure temperature and will send this temperature measurement as a voltage, let's say between 0 volts and 10 volts. 0 volts is the minimum temperature, 10 volt is the maximum temperature, whatever this maximum temperature is. And the controller can produce a signal back to the actuator. Again, same thing between 0 volts and 10 volt. 0 volt, the valve will be fully closed, 10 volt will be fully open, and anything in between. So we are exchanging information here. But this type of information is called analog information. In fact, we cannot really go very far with this kind of analog transmission, because I would need a wire, a specific wire or pair of wires between the sensor and the controller, and there will, there will be a voltage. Same thing between the controller and the actuator. I cannot really create a network where probably I need to communicate with multiple sensors and multiple actuators. What if my uh, controller needs to control temperature in different rooms? and each room has its own actuator or its own valve. Well, in this case, we would have to wire for every sensor to the controller, create some pairs of wires and connect them to that controller. Okay? The data communication, digital data communication will solve this problem by allowing us to transmit digitally. So everything will be transmitted as data, zeros and ones. Transmitting digitally makes things much more efficient because transmitting digitally now will allow us to have a network. Now, a network meaning I might have my controller here. And like two wires like this. And then I have sensor one, sensor two, actuator one, etc. They all can share the same medium, the same wire. They can communicate using the same medium, something that we cannot really do when we are doing analog transmission of this type of information. And this is the digital data communication. In an industrial context, as I mentioned, it's typically the communication you want between sensors, between actuators, controllers, computers.
Okay, so analog is when we are transmitting a value that is a continuum on a continuum, like a voltage. And this voltage only takes a value, say, between 0 volt and 10 volt. And as I mentioned, it's analog, meaning the problem is if I'm using the wire to transmit this voltage between one sensor and one controller, I cannot share the same wire with another sensor because if sensor one is pulling this wire at seven volts, sensor two wants to put it at three volts, it's going to drop at three volts. So there will be interference and we can only transmit one sensor at a time. And it will be a very problematic because we need to coordinate the sensors and how they can communicate. So each sensor should have should be a computer. And this is what leads to digital data communication. Now in digital data communication, we do not transmit, say, temperature as a voltage between 0 and 10 volts. No, we convert the temperature into values, like every time instant, say every 10 milliseconds or every one second, I have a value, say 7 volts. It will be converted to some binary number, like this. This will be transmitted as data, like one byte eventually. It will be transmitted on a certain wire transmitted it could be transmitted as a voltage on a certain wire like one meaning five volts zero meaning zero volts in reality it's not like this but something similar zeros and ones the beauty with this is that my devices will be now smart devices digital devices they have a kind of processor in them so with these types of digital devices we can connect multiple devices on the same wire and they should be able to communicate together. So now we would have this configuration that we saw. So I have sensor one, yeah, something like this, sensor two, sensor three, and they can communicate digitally on the same pieces of wire. So, uh, so the same uh, cable. This means that if I have a distance, let's say my sensors are here, uh, 300 meters away from my controller. Here's my controller. They are 300 meters away. Typically, I would need just 300 meters of wires. If I didn't have this and I have like 10 sensors, they are all 300 meters from the controller, I would need 3,000 meters of wires, okay, or of cable. To connect them. So digital has this advantage allowing us to transmit and to communicate on the same wire because we have this intelligence in those devices. And the beauty of it is that since these devices now the sensors are smart, they are they have a computer in them. In fact, even they might not seem so, but they have a computer in them. They have a processor allowing them to communicate digitally like other computers. This means that they are able to transmit not just a single measurement. They can transmit things like diagnostic information. Imagine I'm using a pressure sensor. It measures pressure, but it detects an error in its own configuration. It can tell us so. It can send us this information. This could be very useful uh, for safety, for example. I might be able to configure that sensor um, online. So send the data to the sensor. So not just receive data from the sensor, I can send to the sensor. So I can configure, I can calibrate the sensor on the network while sitting 300 meters away from those sensors. Okay? So this offers a lot of advantages, this idea of digital data communication. Something that when you are using computers, it feels natural. I have a smartphone and a computer, I can transmit data between these quite easily. This is what's happening all the time in our personal lives. Now, in industrial settings, it was not really uh, the case. Sensors and actuators and controllers had to communicate via wires and voltages or electric currents and not necessarily in digital form. And with uh, more and more um, ease at which one can introduce a microprocessor into every device came this digitization. So we can now 
uh, speak of digital data communication in an industrial setting, meaning every device, a sensor, an actuator, a controller, a computer, they can communicate together. Okay? And they are sharing the medium. They are sharing the cable. They could be transmitting wirelessly, and they are sharing the, uh, the frequency at which we are transmitting, like we have in Wi-Fi. In Wi-Fi, we are, if we are sitting in the same room, we are all sharing the same frequencies. But since our devices are smart, they can coordinate who can transmit when, and the same is, is done in digital data communication. Now, some terminologies in data communication, not just for industrial communication in general, because sometimes we see these terms being used, and then we'll concentrate more on the um, industrial data communication. Now, we say a communication is simplex if we transmit in one direction only. It's like I have a sensor and a controller, and only the data should go from the sensor to the controller. We say a communication is half duplex if we can transmit in both directions, but one direction at a time, which is often the case. Like if I have one sensor, one device, and one controller, it's either the device communicates to the controller or the other way around. Or we might have what's called full duplex. Here, the devices can at the same time transmit and receive. So I might have like two computers, they are transmitting and receiving at the same time. So full duplex will let us communicate in a faster way because I don't have to wait until another device stops transmitting to me so that I can transmit back to them. I can transmit to them at the same time. So this is when you see full duplex, meaning a device can transmit and receive at the same time. Now, the type of transmission, how data will be transmitted. Now, the information that we have, like if I'm measuring temperature and this temperature is um, 70 degrees Celsius. First thing in our sensors in general, it's converted to some voltage. Let's say it will be converted to seven volts. Then it will be converted to binary. Let's say it will be converted to something like this. Okay, eight bits, 16 bits, etc. This is the data that will be transmitted on the digital network. Okay? Because everything that is computer-based, that is processor-based, is digital. So it deals with binary numbers. So this is something that we have to keep in mind. Information is converted into bits. A number, a value that you are measuring, will be converted into a sequence of bits. And we are transmitting those bits, exchanging those bits. Now, there's what's called serial transmission, which is what we see in probably all the cases. Serial transmissions is when we transmit those bits one after the other. So we have a wire, and on this wire, we'll be transmitting one, and after that, a zero, after that, a one, after that, a zero. Okay. So if I'm transmitting one byte composed of eight bits, I would need to transmit them like eight times or at eight different steps. Okay. So this is how we transmit in serial transmission. So you see that a device is here connected to another device, and between them, there's just two wires. This means that we are doing serial transmission. Every bit will be transmitted after. This means that we are doing serial transmission. Every bit will be transmitted after the other. We have what's called parallel transmission. It's another uh, situation where we transmit one byte at a time or a larger than one byte. So in this case, instead of, so this is your serial. Instead of transmitting those bits one after the other, I might have something like this. So two devices and eventually eight wires between them. Okay, this is parallel. Eight wires between them, so they will be transmitting these as follows, like 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. At one time instant, all those zeros and ones will be transmitted at once. Now, this parallel transmission is suitable in general within a, um, within a circuit, on a motherboard, 
but not between devices that are uh, far from each other. So even though it might seem advantageous to transmit in parallel because in one cycle, because everything that happens on a digital computer is going to follow a cycle, so which is what we would call the clock, like say every microsecond, every nanosecond, something happens. In parallel transmission, like every microsecond will be transmitting eight bits. Serial, every microsecond will be transmitting one bit. So parallel might seem much faster, which is the case. But the problem in parallel, especially when the distances start to be in the meters, is that there will be a lot of interference between each other, between those wires, okay? So it is kept really for very short distances, like on a small uh, motherboard or a printed circuit board, but not between devices. Between devices, it's typically serial that's being used. So everything that we will mention in a moment is serial communication. Then we have the concept of synchronous and asynchronous communication. Synchronous communication is when data is transmitted continuously. In other terms, data will be converted into like chunks that are transmitted. And these are big chunks, like every thousand bits will constitute a chunk and it's transmitting. So we are going to transmit during 1000 cycles. This is typically synchronous transmission. Asynchronous is when we transmit one byte at a time, typically one byte at a time, like one byte, meaning eight bits. And then when needed, we transmit another eight bits and then another eight bits. So in asynchronous transmission, there should be within each block, each character, think of it as in synchronous, I want to transmit the letter or the word hello, I'll transmit it like this as a continuum, hello. Here, I'll transmit H. And after some time, I'll transmit E. After them, to some time, I'll transmit L. And then L. And then O. So we transmit them like character by character. The synchronization with asynchronous is actually based on every character that was transmitted. This is what's called a start and a stop bit. So at the beginning, we indicate that we started. And at the end, we indicate that we terminated. So synchronous and asynchronous, both exist in industrial applications, both are applicable. For example, Ethernet, Ethernet, which is what we use on uh, computer networks. Whenever you are using a computer network that is uh, wired in, in your office, your home, your plant, there's a good chance that you are using Ethernet. So Ethernet is synchronous. Okay? And there are uh, other situations where we'll be communicating in asynchronous mode, in particular when we connect like a device to a computer, we'll be communicating in asynchronous mode over what's called a serial line. So these are general terms used in data communication. Now, when we create a network, because the whole idea in data communication, digital data communication, the importance of it is to allow us to create networks so that multiple devices can exchange data on that network. Think of the example, multiple sensors and distributing those sensors in different uh, rooms, for example. I want to get temperature from them. I have a controller. The controller would decide and send some control signals to different valves to control the temperature in each of these rooms. So I need multiple sensors, multiple actuators and a controller to communicate with each other. In networks, we have different shapes that we can, so we can connect devices in different ways. The simplest type is when we don't even have a network, point to point, just two devices, one communicating with the other. Think of it as I have a sensor and a computer, and the sensor is constantly sending the data to the computer, and eventually the computer is sending back some configuration point to point. It could be feasible. Star topology. Here, all devices will connect to a central device. And if two devices want to talk to each other, like A and B, they would have to send to the central device and the central device will send to B. In Wi-Fi, this is what we have. When you use Wi-Fi and you use an access point, this is what you are using. Everything goes through the access point. 
a variant of this star topology is called a tree topology. So a node that will deliver to other nodes and then other nodes to other nodes. Something similar we can think of is when, when we are uh, using USB. In USB, you plug in your computer a USB. Um, for example, it could be a USB hub. And then this hub will have multiple ports. And then you plug other devices. You can plug another hub into this hub. So you can create a kind of tree. So this is also uh, feasible. And then you have a grid-like topology or a mesh topology where different devices can be connected to different other devices. Like almost everyone is connected to everyone. What's advantageous here is that there are multiple paths between different nodes. This is used in situations where we believe there might be disconnections. For example, here, if this is a link that's broken, it's not a problem because we can still continue communicating like this. So two devices can still communicate with each other. Um, and uh, the end on the internet itself, it's like this. This is the internet. It's composed of routers and routers are connected to multiple routers and this creates this whole network. Now in an industrial setting, where you see these kinds of mesh topologies in what's called wireless sensor networks. For example, you want to distribute a group of sensors outdoors. We have uh, an application that could be on a pipeline. We want to track or take measurements, or it's in agriculture. We want to install sensors in a certain field, and we want to cover a large area. And we want these to be wireless because we cannot just uh, use wires. So we would use wireless. In this case, we might create this kind of network where sensors that are connected to, close to each other, they are not really very far. It could be like 50 meters, 100 meters away from each other. But each time I add a sensor, it extends the network. So I can cover a large area without needing to transmit over long distances between any two sensors, because every sensor will just have to communicate with its neighboring sensor, and we can cover a large area. So this type of mesh networks is very suitable for wireless sensor networks. And then you have a ring topology. And a ring topology, as you can see, it's a ring. Every device has an input and an output. So we send to an input a device. If the device is not the destination, it will just send it to its output, to its output. This is usually used for infrastructure. So infrastructure, uh, you are using like large uh, networks and or large switches, what you call switches. And you want to interconnect, say, multiple remote locations that you have, multiple stations. You would connect them in a ring topology. Ring topology also offers some kind of redundancy because if there's a broken wire here, we can still communicate in this manner. So this is ring topology, typically for infrastructure. The bus topology is the most common in a factory or a plant where we are dealing with sensors and actuators. It's the most common, sensors, actuators. It's the bus topology. Bus topology is like, you can see it here, we plug in devices onto a bus. In fact, this is the type of network that we have uh, for electricity. So in your home and electricity, you plug in the appliances in a power socket, and actually we are sharing the same wire. So all we are extracting the same voltage. This is a bus topology. And the same here is for the networks. Okay. So as you can see, these topologies, all every one of them has its place in industrial data communications. So if you are concentrating on the field where we have the sensors, the actuators, the controllers, it's most probably a bus topology. Okay? And if we are concentrating on the infrastructure, it's probably ring topology. If it's wireless sensor networks, probably grid topology. And point-to-point -point topology, for example, it could be used in situations where I have a master station, like a control center, and on the other side, I have a remote station, and they just have to communicate with each other. 
the remote station could be two kilometers away or 10 kilometers away. We just need updates from this remote station. No need to create a network, just one device communicating with another device. Now, in industrial networks, it is really required to make them simple. Simple because the devices that are communicating are relatively simple devices. So when we say we have a sensor or an actuator, this is it could be like a temperature device, like a thermometer, uh, or an actuator like a valve. We do not expect these devices, and we, we do not really think of them as computers or servers that are so complicated. We want to simplify their operations. So the simpler the access to the network is, the better. And the other reason why we want them to be simpler is because the more complex the device is, the more it can uh, break, the more uh, bugs or errors you might find out of them. For example, on a computer, you might have the blue screen, like the Windows blue screen. It's because it's very complicated, a computer. I do not want my temperature sensor or my pressure sensor to be constantly freezing or creating this blue screen, the equivalent of a blue screen. I want it to run for years without ever failing. Okay, So we would prefer devices to be simple. So the networks, we want them to be simple. Now imagine that you have the following on a network. We are using a bus device, bus uh, um, topology here. And here we have a controller. So this big block here is our controller. Controller and these are the sensors. One, two, and actuator one, actuator two. Okay. Now since these are sharing the medium, sharing the wire, in reality, even though they are digital, they cannot transmit at the same time. No two devices can transmit at the same time because ultimately it would be all about voltages. If two devices try to transmit at the same time, it will be just noise. Same thing that happens in wireless. If two devices try to transmit on Wi-Fi, for example, using the same frequency at the same time, it will be just noise. So in digital, the advantage is that, as we've mentioned before, they can coordinate. A device can say, you, you, you start first, you go first, after you, I will, I'll uh, do my communication. Okay? Now, if left alone, the typical strategy would be something that we'll see in a moment. It's called carrier sense, multiple access with collision detection. What does this mean? It means that every device, before it tries to transmit on the network, it will listen to the network. Is anyone else is communicating? If not, it will try to communicate. Now, first of all, this will add some complexity. And second, even if we do so, there's a possibility that two devices try to communicate exactly at the same time. So they both listen. They both notice that no one else is talking on the network and they both will start. It's like in um, on a table, like in dinner on a table, uh, you want to speak, you notice that no one else is speaking, and at the same time, you start speaking and someone else also starts speaking. It happens a lot. So what people do, they would back off, wait for a random amount of time, and they will try again. Okay? One will say to the other, no, no, please go ahead. Okay? So the same can happen here in communication when, so between devices when we are sharing the medium. This will make the whole strategy complicated, having to back off, having to listen, wait for a random amount of time, try again. And this will add a lot of uncertainties because if my sensor wants to give information to the controller, it tries to communicate, but it cannot because someone else is communicating. It will have to wait. And then imagine that after that, it will try to communicate. Then someone else tries to communicate exactly at the same time. There will uh, be a collision between them. So they will have both to back off, try again randomly. So this means that we cannot guarantee when a device can communicate. Is it going to communicate in 10 milliseconds or in 100 milliseconds 
or in one second. It depends on how strongly this network is being used. To simplify all of this, we have a simple technique that's called master-slave communication. It will solve all this problem. What is this master-slave? The controller will be the master. Everything else will be a slave. It's only the master who will be deciding to ask the slaves to get them information or to give them information. So a slave on its own cannot initiate the communication. We avoid, in this case, the problem that two devices trying to communicate at the same time. Okay? So the master, a controller, or a computer will ask sensor one, give me your data. Boom, it's done. Sensor two, give me your data. Done. Actuator one, here's your data. Actuator two, here's your data. And then it will repeat with cycles. This will make now our network what's called deterministic. Deterministic meaning we know exactly how much time it will take for us to communicate. There's no randomness in it. I define a cycle every 10 milliseconds. I'm going to repeat this whole cycle. For every 100 milliseconds, I'm going to repeat this whole cycle. We are deterministic. So this is used in a network that's called Profibus, the for Profibus DP for decentralized peripheral. Common between devices and controls in the field. In situations where, in industrial settings, where we have multiple masters, not a single master, who are these multiple masters? I can have multiple controllers, controller one, controller two, and here I have a computer eventually, and another computer, all of them, computer one and computer two, they need to communicate. They need to communicate eventually with other devices that are on the network like sensors and actuators. What is possible and what is used is what's called a token ring. Token ring meaning those masters will have an order and in order every device will try to communicate with this, the slaves on the network and when they are done, they give the token to the next device that will communicate, and then the next device. Again, this will simplify the communication with the slaves and will add a slightly an extra layer to the masters because they have to manage the tokens. This is also existing. It's existing in what's called Modebus Plus, which is another technology or existing in what's called Modebus Plus, which is another technology or what's called a protocol that's used in the industry allowing computers and controllers to talk to each other. So we might have multiple computers who are all uh, masters, and they need to count to talk to multiple controllers who are eventually slaves. So we have what's called Modbus Plus here. It's a protocol. The third strategy is like the more kind of random strategy. It's called carrier sense, multiple access with collision detection. This is what we have on the ethernet. So if you are using a wired network in your office or home where you plug in a wire to your computer, you're using ethernet. Even if you are connecting using Wi-Fi, most probably your Wi-Fi access point is connected to some switch. The switch is the device that looks like this where you have different ports and then we connect to these ports, and here you would have LEDs flashing, all the time flashing, blah, 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 on, off, on, off. This is a switch. So most probably around you, there's a switch right now, or multiple switches. So even if you are connecting using Wi-Fi, those switches are Ethernet switches. So we are using Ethernet. In Ethernet, you have this carrier sense multiple access, meaning devices can communicate whenever they want. They just listen to the medium. If no one else is communicating, they will start communicating with this possibility that another device will try to communicate at the same time, and they would have to back off to retry again. And this add randomness. Randomness. Now, randomness doesn't mean that it's like very bad. For commercial applications, 
or personal and consumer applications, it is not a big deal. Because imagine that you want to access a website. You click on a link to access a website. Sometimes it takes you 20 milliseconds, sometimes 10 milliseconds, sometimes 50 milliseconds to access that website. You wouldn't even feel it. It's not a big deal. But in an industrial setting, it would be a big deal because randomness, this inability to know exactly how much time it will take us to communicate would be problematic in an industrial setting. We'll give an example in a moment to show why determinism is important in industrial settings. So here, randomness in Ethernet, not a big deal in commercial applications uh, or applications where this randomness is not important. For example, in voice communication, this randomness could be important. Okay, now, whenever you speak of data communication, people might tell you there's this ISO OSI layered model, the layers, layer one, layer two, layer three. Now, what do these mean? It's a model that makes the communicate or kind of standardizes the communication between devices, between nodes. Because if we think about it, when my computer wants to communicate with your computer, there are a lot of things that should be defined. The first thing that should be defined is how on the physical level we would communicate. Is it going to be wireless? Is it going to be via wires? Uh, what kind of frequencies we'll be using? So this is the physical level. Then if we are on the same network, like my computer is connected on the same network with some other computers. Well, we need to know when a certain computer can start communicating. Remember this carrier sense with multiple access, this needs to be defined, like how the computer will listen, how it will back off for how much time, and how to identify a computer on the network to know that this is actually the computer who starts communicating, who is the destination on that network. If I receive a, a data on a local network like in my house, is, it, is this data for my smartphone or is it for my laptop or so for whom it is destined. So this is the address that we should be dealing with. It's called the link layer. So coordinating the communication. If we are not on the same network, like between my computer and your computer right now, we need to deal with routers, routing. Because there are multiple nodes between my computer and computer, and every node will listen, will look at a packet that's transmitted and it will have to send this packet to another router, then to another router, then to another router, another router. All of this is done based on the addresses. So if my computer is transmitting to some server in Australia, the router that will receive my packet will look at it as destination, it will see Australia. And then it says, here's the next router I should be sending to. Next router will do the same until it arrives to destination. This is where you see things like IP addresses. So on your computer, there's an IP address. These are the IP addresses that are used for routing. By looking at the IP address, we can tell where is, what's the network of that device, and the routers can transmit the data accordingly. And then above that, you have what's called the transport layer. We have to deal with things like, if there's a large file to transmit, like my voice, when I'm speaking, my voice will be like composed of smaller packets. Every packet, let's say it's one, I don't know, 100 milliseconds. These should be transmitted. The receiver side, like from your side, these will be captured, combined together to produce the sound, complete sound. How this is done? Well, there's what's called the transport layer that will do just that. It has to deal with splitting the data into smaller packets, transmitting those packets, if a packet did not arrive, retransmitting it again so that it will arrive. And then we have session layer and presentation layer. Session layer is when we create a session, like now we are within the same session communicating. Presentation layer dealing with formats, formats, encryption, things like that. So we need to agree on the encryption if we are encrypting data or the format of data. And above all, the application layer. It's like 
what are we using? Are we using a website? Are we using voice over IP? Are we sending a specific command to a computer or to a controller? So all of these layers are actually layers that might be needed in data communication between computers. When we communicate on the internet, we have the coverage of all of that. But in industrial networks, you do not necessarily need them all. In industrial networks, you would need typically the physical layer. So let me delete all of this. You would need the physical layer because always, 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 we are connected to some physical layer, some cable or wireless. You would need the link layer because in industrial networks, like a network that I have in a plant or a factory, it's actually a local network. So we need to coordinate which device can communicate when, and you would need the application layer. These are typically the layers that we use. Application layers because if a controller is sending a command to an actuator, it's the application layer. Okay, so this is, this is the meaning of layers. When you say, I have a device, it's a layer three device. It's a device that's acting here on the routing part. This is a standard that covers layers one and two. So it's a standard that covers the physical level and this coordination. For example, Wi-Fi and Ethernet, they cover layers one and two, okay? We say that here's a protocol that is a layer seven protocol. It actually covers just the applications. The rest should be covered by something else, some other standards and protocols. So this is a um, something that you might be seeing when you are uh, discussing or reviewing uh, networking in an industrial setting. Not necessarily in industrial settings, but in particular in industrial settings. Now, the media itself, what are these, the, the, the physical layer? What do we use? Well, what is very common is twisted wire. So it's copper, and these wires are twisted like this. Twisting them make them more resistant to noise. This is why they are twisted. So if you open up a cable, data communication cable, you would notice inside it that it's twisted. The wires are twisted. It's for noise. It blocks significantly noise by doing so. Or coaxial cables, they are used. Or fiber, or wireless. Okay, so these are possible. Fiber optics is much faster and it's not at all affected by the same noise as the other cables, like the copper, but much trickier to deal with. So in general, we would use fiber for the infrastructure and the distribution would use the copper. Now, the requirements for data communication in an industrial setting. If we are in control and a control application, like real-time control, the example that I mentioned before, you receive a sensor data to a controller and your controller should act. Usually what we want, we want short cycle times. We want fast responses. We call this the latency. Latency is the time needed between the moment we transmit and the moment the data arrives. This latency should be in the milliseconds. Very important also is determinism, what we call jitter. This is the randomness. I want this randomness to be as small as possible, meaning when one device wants to communicate with another device, jitter should be small, the delay should always be constant. Like if it's 10 milliseconds, I want it always to be 10 milliseconds. Let me give you an example. Imagine you have an application where there's a camera here. The camera is watching when objects are falling. It sends data to a controller. The controller sends data to a robotic arm. trying to capture or to catch this object, this moving object. Now, between the moment the camera detects the object and the controller receives the signal and then transmits the signal to the robot, let's say it's acceptable for us to be 20 milliseconds. So we need a cycle time of 20 milliseconds. But what is more important than this would be the jitter 
the determinism. Because if the message arrives slightly earlier or slightly later, we will not catch this ball. We'll catch it, we'll try to catch it too early or too late. Okay? So here probably my latency is acceptable to be 20 milliseconds. My jitter, I want it to be less than one millisecond. Okay? Because otherwise I will miss catching this ball. This is an application, it's a control application, it's real-time control. The sensor in this case is the camera, the actuator is the robotic arm, and this is motion control. We want all the data to be transmitted within a very predictable time. And determinism is essential here. In other types of applications like in data acquisition, what's called SCADA, supervisory control and data acquisition. In these cases, cycle time and determinism are not as critical you might your objective is to, to collect information from a remote station like you have tanks in a remote location you want to constantly get a measure of their level it doesn't have to be every 20 milliseconds and determinism is not as important so in these applications cycle times in one second is okay Determinism is not very important, but I need always to get access to this. So it depends on where we are operating. We might need more strict control of jitter and latency or less strict control of jitter and latency. And actually in an industrial setting, kind of all of these uh, are possible. So from the low level, it's called level zero, where we have sensors and actuators where I want things to be very fast in the milliseconds, up to the information system in our company, which is level three, where we'll be transmitting data, like files and things like that. And I can transmit every minute, every few seconds. It's not really a big deal. So you have all these possibilities, the range from sensor levels up to the computer's levels at um, the business network meaning where we do not have controllers. And for every region, you might find that there are different technologies being used. For example, at the sensor level, we might have things like ASI, actuator sensor interface. When we get slightly more comp uh, software sensor interface, when we get slightly more comp uh, sophisticated, we'll see things like field bus systems. These are called field bus systems, like Profibus, used in, mainly in Europe. Foundation field bus used mainly in the US. And then when you move up, you will get to see things like Ethernet, TCP IP, Ethernet, TCP IP, HTTP, what you are using right now when connecting to the internet. Okay? So in terms of the networks that you see, the technologies that are being used, Ethernet, TCP IP, mode bus, they are typically between PLCs or controllers, because PLC stands for a programmable logic controller. So these when they are communicating with each other and controllers with computers. But this ethernet is being extended more and more towards level one or even level zero. So meaning down to the sensor level. You have this technology can open. It's to allow multiple devices to communicate with the controller. For example, something like in a car. In a car, you might have multiple sensors would communicate using a network like this. This ASI is just for level zero, sensors and actuators, exchanging very basic information. Mode bus here, sometimes it's used if Ethernet is not possible. Mode bus is, by the way, it's very old standard and it's still being used commonly to communicate between computers and controllers. In data acquisition, supervisor control and data acquisition, then the technologies that you will see are these. DNP3, it's a, it's called a protocol, very commonly used or and, and suitable for supervisory control and data acquisition applications. Like I have a remote station, I have a master station, I need to exchange data. Imagine it's um, in um, electricity distribution. You have a master station, and you have a lot of stations uh, distributed all over the region and you want to get data from them. You don't want to get measurements from them. So DMP3 
and the other alternative, this one here, IEC 6870-5, are built for that. They were built, by the way, for the electrical industry. And depending on where you are, you might see things like Profibus. This is mainly pushed by Siemens, DeviceNet, Allen Bradley. So we might be seeing these or utilizing these. Now, um, these are more in Europe. These are more in the US. Now, how an, a network might look like? What kind of architecture we would have in an industrial setting? Well, here's how. You might have the field level. This is the field. Cycle time should be in the milliseconds, few milliseconds. You would have things like sensors, actuators, uh, valves, motors. On top of that, you have computers and controllers. On top of that, you have computers and the business level. Okay, cycle time increases when you move up because it's not as critical. And here it's a Profibus based architecture, meaning Siemens pushed, meaning it's more common in Europe. So we have different versions, Profibus PA, Profibus DP, and then we have what's called Profibus FMS. And then there's even something called Profinet. So at different levels, you have different technologies, even if they are all within the same name, which is Profibus because the requirements are not the same. Here's another example with foundation field bus, like kind of the equivalent of Profibus, but more a US-based system. I have H1 here, HSE for, it's like ethernet high level and different devices communicating over a network with different computers and controllers. So here are some alternatives um, you have Profibus, Ethernet, so one Profibus is more European like the other more US. And you can in all of, and here you have also Modbus with Ethercat. And all of these we can do real time or what's called even hard real time. The example I gave when we are trying to catch the ball is called hard real time, meaning we cannot get too soon, we cannot get too late. It should be exactly on time. Real time, it's slightly more flexible. So in both cases, these are done and non-real time, it's clearly done. Now, what kind of performance you would expect in these technologies? Here, Ethercat, Cercos, Profinet, IRT, you would expect response times less than 0 0.1 milliseconds you can get, okay? Really, really fast response times. And depending on how far you go, it could get here to a millisecond or so. But all of this is quite great for control applications, for industrial applications, and in particular, control applications. Because the most demanding will be these real-time applications. Okay. Now, let me show you the, um, um, in, in a moment, we'll show you the effect of delays. Because why we are so interested in this delay here, response time? because it can make our controller perform well or very bad. So I'll show you in a moment in a simulation what would happen when you increase this response time, for example, in a network. Okay? It can make a controller perform quite well. So I want my variable, the, the yellow line, to follow the pink, and here it's doing a great job, to something very bad like this, where my yellow line will just oscillate. It's like you're trying to position an object on a table. It will just oscillate. It doesn't stabilize. Okay. Now, what are the trends? Before we just go to, to my screen, I will do this demo. Trends are more Ethernet down to the field, more wireless. Wireless with these standards here, something called wireless heart, ISA 111A. These are for sensors and allowing them to communicate wirelessly with a what's called a gateway so that they will be part of a network but they can communicate wirelessly and the very important 5g cellular network 5g in fact it has significant applications in an industrial setting the 5g wireless it's great in fact 5g can get you certain latencies in the three milliseconds 
a three milliseconds later latency using 5G network is the equivalent of having to create those wires and the like between your controller and your sensor. So if my I have my controller is a 5G connectable and my sensor is 5G connectable, I can perform all of this using 5G. So it's really, really important as a technology 5G network in the cellular. And then you have more standardization of how data is exchanged between, between devices. Because as you saw, there are a variety of uh, data and a variety of devices. There's one of them, it's called Open Platform Communications, OPC, that allows devices to share kind of common language. It's a standard initially initiated by Microsoft to allow devices to communicate using a kind of common language. Think of it like exchanging data using PDF. Everyone knows how to read PDF, okay? This is the idea. Okay, so, and all of this is in the context of what's called Industry 4.0, which is more communication, more digitization, and more intelligence. Now, let me share my screen rapidly for one minute, probably, and show you how the, um, the effect the effect of delay in a network, how it, it will, the effect of delay in a network, how it, it will be changing the way your system would respond. Okay, so I'm going to share the whole screen. Okay, so here I have, let me wait for it. Okay, here I have a um, uh, design where there's a system here. We're not interested in what system is, a simple system. It's a control, like I'm controlling, for example, temperature or position of an object. This is a controller here. The controller measures what's being received from the field, compares it to a set point and acts. And I'm introducing a delay here between the controller and the actual actuator, okay? So the delay, I'm going to put it here at first 0.1 seconds. So small delay. Let us see what happens. I will ask my uh, position to go from zero to one. It's like I'm positioning a ball or an object from zero to one. Effectively, it's happening very, very smoothly. I go to one, all good. Let us increase the delay. It becomes one second. Now notice I'm oscillating and it will take me like 20 seconds to stabilize the same object. Now, 1.1 seconds, or 1.5 seconds. Much, much worse. We would have to wait like 70 seconds for things to stabilize. This is the effect of delay in a network, okay? So the more delay we have, especially in real-time networks, the stranger the response would be, okay? And this is this is it for today and for this webinar. I will share the last slide. Okay. Okay, now this topic here that we saw, which is data communication, uh, it is relevant to, or you will see it in much more details in other courses that are offered by EIT that are where you will see this data communication. There's the advanced diploma of industrial data communication, advanced diploma of industrial automation, and the bachelor's in industrial automation and the master in industrial automation. And this is it from my side. Sepiso, I will leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hardy, for that presentation. I hope that everyone has enjoyed it as well. Uh, so as Dr. Hardy has mentioned, these are the courses that we have, uh, that the topic that we had today cover, uh, that's the advanced diploma that has the exact name, Industrial Data Communication Networking and IT. This is an 18 months program and the prerequisites uh, that you have about two years minimum working experience in the related field. Same as well as the advanced diploma in industrial automation engineering. 
We also do offer the online Bachelors of Science uh, in Industrial Automation Engineering. And this program, you can study either online or on campus, depending on what your preference is, as well as the Masters of Engineering in the same field, uh, Industrial Automation Engineering. And you'll be able to study all of these courses at EIT you are more than welcome to inquire with us. Uh, a course advisor such as myself will be able to contact you to discuss the details of the course. Okay, these are our upcoming courses uh, for the year. Uh, this is just a snippet of the schedule that we have. We have quite a lot of courses that are coming up. Uh, during this current month and later on in the year. Uh, as you can see, I will be sharing a link to the course schedule on the chat box so that you guys are able to uh, follow the link in order uh, to see the courses that we have on offer uh, at the institution that will be coming up uh, in the month of April and the months to follow after that. And then these are our upcoming webinars. Uh, topics such as these that are technical topic webinars, you are more than welcome to visit the EIT website as well as our events page. You'll be able to see all our webinars that we have. Uh, we have uh, quite a lot for uh, April, as you can see. Uh, we have one next week, in fact. So if you are interested in any of these topics, you are more than welcome to register for them. Uh, and then they will be conducted in the same manner as the one that we have hosted today. And then lastly, uh, the certificate of attendance. As this is a technical topic, uh, I have advised that uh, yes, our attendees will be receiving uh, the certificates of attendance. Uh, you will receive these uh, digitally. Uh, as you can see, there is a link up on the screen that you're able to follow as well as a QR code. Kindly note that this form will close on Monday, the 8th of April at 5 a.m. UTC time. Please make sure uh, to convert the time to where you are based uh, so that you are sure when the form will be closing uh, for your certificate of attendance. I'm just going to leave the link uh, in the chat box, uh, the QR code I will return to uh, straight after the post uh, webinar questions. If you have any questions for Dr. Hardy, uh, about 15 minutes should suffice to uh, for him to answer those questions. Please put them in the chat box. If there aren't any questions, I will be going back to the slide that has the QR code to scan. And then I am leaving the link for you guys to follow in order to receive your certificate of attendance. Please, guys, make sure that you fill in the form before the specified time so that you're able to receive uh, the certificate of attendance, the marketing team will make sure that you receive it, provided that you are able to fill in that form with your correct details. Please make sure that you fill in your full names and surnames, just as it will appear uh, on an identification documents, capitalize uh, your names and surnames so that you are able to get that uh, certificate that looks professional and you are able to share it on any platform that you wish to do so. Uh, Dr. Hardy, I'm not sure if you have any questions today. However, I'll just open the floor uh, for any questions that uh, our attendees have. You can put them in the chat box. Just give you five minutes, guys, so that you are able to ask uh, Dr. Hardy the questions. And then I will go about with sending you uh, the link to the EIT course schedule. Okay, see a question, what suggestions for someone in IT transitioning to OT and industrial jobs? Uh, basically, is to follow the trends that uh, that are there, It's which is a fusion, by the way, between IT and, uh, and OT in terms of the technologies used for data communication and the trends that we've mentioned, actually, like uh, the use of Ethernet, 
wireless, 5G, uh, and standards, something like uh, OPC. It's operational technology, okay, for information and operation. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if that is all, uh, I'll just like to, okay, there we go. They, we do have another question. Uh, could you please just send your questions through on the chat box? Okay, certifications uh, in uh, with a degree in telecommunications. Uh, uh, I guess for this, you would have probably to contact a uh, course advisor at EIT to see what, what would be... Um, there's a list of all certificates. Now, usually there's no entry requirements for these certificates or they are uh, not very uh, um, strict, uh, which is not the case if you want to pursue a degree. But please contact a um, course advisor at EIT or on the website. There, there, there are the entry requirements for every uh, every certificate or degree. Now, PLCs are programmable logic controllers. These are computer systems that act as controllers. You, they connect to sensors, they connect to actuators, and they program them to uh, actually uh, do the job that you want them to, to do, okay? Um, you can start like purchasing a PLC at like $50 up to thousands of dollars. Instrumentation, improving technical and hands-on knowledge. Probably the best of the best like suggestion is to try on a, on a real project uh, if you can. So try really like when, when one gets their hands dirty, try installing an instrument, figuring out how to connect it, what kind of issues we are facing. This is really how we, we get better at it. Best thing is actually to try. Uh, what is the difference between PLC and microcontrollers? In fact, a microcontroller is a small chip that will be uh, like like two centimeters squared. This is a microcontroller. You can program it; it can do the uh, the control for you. But it's actually developed and designed to be embedded into systems. Like you would put a microcontroller in a microwave oven, or in a washing machine, or in a printer. The PLC is a larger device. So let's say it's like 20 by 20 centimeters. It's like equivalent of a computer. And a PLC is more used to control a machine, to control a factory. So they, to some extent, are both controllers, but PLC is for larger systems. A microcontroller is to be embedded within a device. These are two different standards, so RS-422 and 485 two different standards for data communication. What is very common is the RS-485. RS-485 allows us to create networks between devices. Uh, and they are, so on top of them, you would have other standards that are uh, the, to complement them. So RS-485 alone is not sufficient. For example, we've mentioned Profibus. You would have Profibus over RS-485, which is the physical level, the physical layer, okay? Pneumatic and PLC. PLC is electronic. It's purely electronic, so computer-based. Pneumatic is a controller that will be uh, the, the the principle of it is acting at air on air pressure. Okay, it's not uh, an electronic. Okay, working on a mechanical suit, I would guess in this case a microcontroller would be su more suitable. Smaller, easy to embed. Can we integrate different data communications like DeviceNet and Profibus? Now, usually, to some extent, yes, but you would need uh, interfaces and gateways. 
unless you are within the same family. Like if it's profi boss, like use the same family of profi boss, profi boss, profi net, etc. Okay, webinar on data analytics and machine learning. So probably this will be uh, scheduled soon at EIT uh, on data analytics and machine learning. Um, I, I believe there's one in the next next few months or so. Uh, how is ISDN essential data communication and is it also needed in industrial setups? ISDN, do you mean the like the uh, the standard for uh, the digital telephony that was used in the past? I doubt it's, it's been it's being used nowadays. In an industrial setting, if you want to build up a SCADA application, supervisor control and data acquisition, I doubt that you'd use this. Uh, licenses to work with various pro communication protocols. What I know is that at EIT, you have access to a remote lab. So this is something that we have. And these are computers where you have multiple uh, multiple systems that are being built and you can you can work with them. Where you would have certain communication protocols, certain machines that are already running and we can uh, we can work with these. Uh, scholarship, partial, I guess so. But for this, please check the uh, the website. But uh, I guess there's there's this possibility. But please check the website and eventually a course advisor. the main challenges now in in certain cases it will be the uh, interfacing with between different devices okay so uh, but in general if we are operating within the same um, like the same uh, family of of protocols there wouldn't be a lot of problems now there's always a challenge of noise and the data communication Okay, questions, uh, so uh, suggestion, any courses for improvement? There are uh, very interesting courses around industrial data communication, uh, Barath, so that could be a good addition to instrument engineer for data communication in general. AI applications, there's most probably one, uh, one AI um, uh, webinar programmed this this most probably one soon okay i think uh, the last question will be alice as we have gone over mm -hmm. time Okay, uh, Wi-Fi, does it usually happen when data communication is applied in industrial settings? Um, do, do you mean there are noises and uh, loss of integrity in data communication over Wi-Fi? Because Wi-Fi itself is not really recommended in an industrial setting. Okay, it's not really recommended in an industrial setting. If you want to communicate between sensors and actuators and controllers, you might use what I mentioned, like wireless heart. Okay. Okay, that should bring us to a wrap up. 
uh, of our post webinar question. Doctor, do you have one last one? I do believe Nicholas is asking one last question. Uh, and then I will be okay. closing uh, the floor up for uh, any questions. Okay, companies taking common protocol and making it proprietary. Most probably open will always uh, will always win. Uh, unless that there's a company that will have so huge of an advantage in terms of technology and then no one else can catch to it. In general, open is, is, is a winning uh, strategy in, in data communication. Okay, everyone, that's it for us today. Thank you so much for your attendance. In the chat box, I have left uh, my email address. I have also left uh, the link to the upcoming webinars. I have also uh, left the link to request for your certificates of attendance. Uh, please utilize the link and make sure to fill in the Microsoft uh, form in order to get your certificates on your mail. Uh, Dr. Hardy, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. I hope to see you next time. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a lovely rest of your day. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye-bye.